Dr. Johnson Haas and welcome back to Geos 1000 Dynamic Earth and in this final learning module for the course we're going to focus upon climate. And you might ask why is a geology class focusing on climate? It's because the climate of this planet is actually a very complicated machine and it involves a lot of the rock cycle as its operation. Over geologic time the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere, the heat content, the climate, the sea level all this stuff is contingent upon a bunch of different variables. And geologic processes such as carbon cycling are some of the big parts of that that affect uh, the geology of the planet and the geology of the planet affects the climate in turn. We've learned a lot about this over the past 30, 40 years by concerning ourselves with anthropogenic modern climate change. Wondering what's going to happen as through our industrial activities, through our civilization, uh, we add CO2 to the atmosphere, this changes the atmospheric chemistry, retains a little bit more thermal energy, and the climate shifts as a result. That much is pretty clear and pretty basic, but the details of how it's going to play out, what the effects of climate change tend to be over geologic time, that's where geology comes in. We can look at the record of, for the Phanerozoic, and you can see the veil curve of sea level going up and down. We know that because we can look at the sediments and how they transgress upon land as sea level rises and regress as sea level falls. Sea level falling if climate's very cold and there's lots of ice locked up in glaciers on the continents. And sea level is high when climate is warm and all that glacial ice is melted back to the sea and the seawater itself is warmer and thermally expanded a bit. So climate affects the history of life, the course of evolution, and we can see its effects in the geology that we dig up. So how does climate operate? In this section of the course you're going to learn all about that. In the textbook, chapter 15 focuses upon global climate change. I recommend that and also following up, although I'll have fewer test questions about it, I think conceptually it's good to follow up with the following chapter 16 about how we use resources. That's one of the ways that we have gotten ourselves into a situation of inadvertently changing the planet's long-term weather uh, through our large-scale activities. So I said climate is a complicated machine. What do I mean by that? Well, what you'll learn in this part of the course is the list of things that goes into affecting climate. And if you want to understand present climate change and its course to the future, it really does pay to understand how this science operates. You'll probably be hearing about this science for the rest of your lives, realistically, because it's playing out over a very long time scale. Climate is a result of the amount of energy in Earth's heat budget in its atmosphere, oceans, and surface. You take all that stuff together, and these are the things that can absorb heat from the sun and retain it. And over time, the average level of that retained energy gives you basically global climate. So what goes into that? Some basic variables that affect climate are, well, first off, the sun, obviously. Without the sun, we'd be a frozen ball of ice in space. The sun delivers energy in the form of short wavelength visible light to Earth's atmosphere. A lot of that passes through the atmosphere, reaches the surface, where it warms things at the surface. It warms the plants, it warms rocks, it warms the ocean surface. And so once the surface is warmed, that heat basks up through the atmosphere as thermal radiation, as infrared, long wavelength. So sunlight coming in, the black body curve of sunlight coming in is focused upon short wavelengths around the visible spectrum. But the outgoing radiation from our planet is thermal, it's infrared. We can read this nowadays with satellites that are constantly staring at the Earth, reading its infrared output. So we can tell the temperature of each region of the planet just by looking at it from space. We actually don't have to rely upon thermometers on the surface that much as we used to. So the sun delivers energy, but do we retain it? The moon gets the same amount of sunlight that the Earth gets uh, per square meter, and notice it's freezing cold at night and pretty hot on the surface in the daytime. That's because the moon has no atmosphere. So the moon doesn't have a climate. Earth has an atmosphere, and so we have a climate by retaining sunlight warmth in the atmosphere for a time until it escapes to space. Essentially, the presence of greenhouse gases strictly determines how much of that infrared and for how long is retained by the atmosphere. So that's our second major influence on climate, greenhouse gases. The composition of the Earth's atmosphere includes major gases such as nitrogen and oxygen, and then trace gases like carbon dioxide, uh, to some extent a little bit of methane, a little bit of nitrous oxide, 
and of course water vapor, which varies a lot from place to place. But the atmosphere as a whole has a pretty homogeneous carbon dioxide concentration. And that's a greenhouse gas because its bonds in its molecule, CO2 molecule, the bonds in that molecule vibrate in harmony with the wavelengths of infrared radiation such that an infrared photon of the right wavelength range comes in, the energy of that photon is transferred to the bond energy and suddenly it's vibrating faster or it's rotating faster. There are specific modes, they spin faster or they vibrate faster. Now eventually they lose that energy. Uh, that warms them up, they retain the energy until they lose it and then they emit a photon back to the atmosphere. But that photon is infrared and it's going off in the atmosphere and if it hits another greenhouse gas molecule it's absorbed again. The more greenhouse gas you have, the more each greenhouse gas molecule has the chance of striking, of being struck by a photon, re releasing it, and then it's hit by another atom or another molecule. And so essentially infrared radiation takes a random walk pathway through the atmosphere, eventually finding a path free to space, and then it's gone. So sunlight coming in, greenhouse gases retaining energy, and what else? Things like albedo matter, reflectivity of the surface. If you've got a white icy surface, it's going to bounce most of that sunlight back into space, like a mirror. And so it tends to keep the atmosphere cold. But if you have a hot surface, like hot asphalt, for example, or basaltic lava flows that are they're solid now, that black material is going to absorb infrared radiation from the sun and get really hot. And so it's not bouncing that energy. It's retaining it in the atmosphere. So darker surfaces, darker albedos, lower albedos, retain a lot more energy, and higher albedos, or more reflective surfaces, allow it to escape into space. And all these things add up to give you the moment-to-moment -moment climate over geologic time. So because carbon dioxide plays such a major role along with the other variables, if something that's affecting the carbon content of the atmosphere, that's going to affect climate. And over geologic time, there's a lot of processes that do that. In my videos, I've got several videos on the carbon cycle that go into this in great detail, so I won't repeat myself here. But the point is that that's where geology comes in, is that you've got carbon in the atmosphere that can dissolve in seawater to make carbonic acid, and ocean life can take calcium and dissolve carbonic acid and make limestone, calcium carbonate. And so the carbon cycle over the long haul of our planet's history has really been had a governor on it which is the carbon cycle. And how fast is carbon buried into sediments for geologic time? How fast is it exhumed and weathered back to the surface, removing the CO2 from rock and taking it back to the atmosphere? Over geologic time, this stuff matters. It doesn't affect us so much on our human time scales. And that's one of the things you'll learn in the videos, is that the carbon cycle actually is several cycles within cycles within cycles. We operate within a short time scale where the the rates of photosynthesis, of carbon uptake from the atmosphere to plants by photosynthesis, its return to the atmosphere by the decomposition of dead plant material. That's on a, a very short time scale, and we understand that part of the carbon cycle, also the rate at which we put CO2 in the atmosphere. But over geologic time, our, our, our concerns for climate have shown us that over geologic time, a lot of other forces come into play too. And that's why this semester, this, this, this part of the course is not just about anthropogenic climate change, although that's a part of it. It's also about understanding what are the natural processes that affect climate. How do we know their scales? How do we know their, their magnitudes and compare it to what we have today? It's true that climate changes all the time, but things cause it to change. The orbit of our planet goes through some small oscillations over thousands of years, called the Milankovitch cycles. And because of those little variations in, in, in orbital parameters, it determines that in some types, some times of history, the northern hemisphere land masses, our planet, most of the land is in the northern hemisphere, so that tends to drive climate this way. When the, the northern hemisphere has got a different sun angle than another time in the northern hemisphere, so that your summers are more intense or your winters are more intense, that affects the entire planet. These Milankovitch cycles are like clockwork, and they're one of the things that affect climate. They're not really affecting us over the time scales of our concern today because they take thousands of years to play out. But it's because of them we have the ice ages. Our history of the last million years, a few million years actually, where climate goes from deep cold 
where continental glaciers creep across, and then warm periods, and then going back to deep cold. And these trace pretty well with the Milankovic cycles. So these are all parts of climate that matter. You only typically hear about the one that anthropogenic short-term climate change, and we're going to learn about that too, but I want you to learn there's a lot more to it than that. I want you to be able to defend yourself against uh, climate change denial ideologies by simply having the facts at your fingertips or understanding when you're being told the half-truth. So to understand climate, we're going to go through in the final lab, Lab 10, looking at the history of climate change that we see recorded in rocks and in ice core records. Antarctic ice core records have been a, a treasure trove of data about climate change in the past 800,000 years. We have the best record there. And so you're going to learn about that, the context of historical climate change, so that you'll understand how our modern change is actually quite different. Uh, quantitatively, the rate of change today compared to the rate of change coming into and out of a glacial period, for example. You look at that in Lab 10. So in Lab 10, and of course Chapter 15 in the book, you're going to be learning about all this stuff, including modern climate change. And not just predictions for the future, but a lot of this is actually very helpful to understand what climate change has already happened. When I say that, I mean over the course of the 20th century, the climate of this planet has changed significantly. It has already happened. It's there. And so part of this lab is going to show you the extent at which that has occurred. And in terms of the major variables that we can see, loss of ice, both sea ice and land ice glaciers melting back. That's visually obvious because we have photo photographs from the 1800s that showed them very different then. We also have the record of weather changes over the 20th century, increase or decrease in rainfall in different regions across the planet, temperature increase, yes, obviously, uh, as well as sea level rise. Sea level rise so far has been only about that much, about 20 centimeters as of when I'm saying this. And that may not seem like much, but if that's a persistent change that also affects tide levels, uh, groundwater penetration of, of seawater into aquifers, that sort of thing, and if it's just the beginning, we do need to kind of know that. It's likely that over the course of your lives, its sea level change will probably amount to something about like that. And that will be almost entirely due to thermal expansion. The water is getting warmer and it actually expands a little bit. So far, we haven't seen a lot of glacial melt to the point that it will raise sea level. This is something that might happen in the future. Uh, and in fact, it might be happening when you listen to this in the distant decades of the future, but it hasn't yet. However, understanding the trends helps us deal with them. It helps us deal with things. And one of the things I hope you get out of this part of the course is a better understanding of how climate operates, the mechanisms by which it operates, its actual, how it's played out over the past hundred years or so, and what it's likely to do next. Because a lot depends upon that. The future's not all bad, it's just going to be different. There's going to be change. The climate change will happen to us and it pays to have some information at your fingertips about how to deal with this and what to expect. So that's what we're dealing with in this part of the part of the course and final lab for the course. So I hope you enjoy that, I hope you get something out of it, and I hope you can retain some persistent knowledge about an improved understanding about climate, about the, the geologic forces that operate to govern it, and frankly a lot of the other parts of the geology of our planet, so that you'll appreciate just going about the planet in your life and seeing rocks and landscapes and, and seeing them in a little bit more deeper perspective than you did before. So that's all for now. Uh, good luck. Talk to you later.